Great. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome once again to uh, an evening um, with Rabbi Rashi Simon with uh, Sages from the Ages, um, the third part of our um, exploration through, through the centuries and uh, key to our personalities. Um, uh, before I pass you on to Rabbi Simon, just a mention if people could please mute themselves by default, but at any time, if you wish to ask a question, you can unmute yourself and ask that, and there will be time at the end as well. Um, with that, I pass you on to Rabbi Simon. Thank you very much, Neil, and thank you to everyone for joining us again uh, tonight, or for those who are just here for the first time. You're very welcome. Also, each of our lectures in this series are uh, self-sufficient, uh, although we will occasionally have opportunity to maybe um, reflect on one of our other um, subjects. what I'm doing to make this screen advance. Right. Um, okay, so our subject tonight is Rabbi Moshe Al Sheikh. So I don't know why the screen is creeping that way. Uh, Rabbi Moshe Al Sheikh, Moshe Ben Chaim Al Sheikh. Uh, so you can see here in the uh, sort of upper left quadrant, he was born in Andrianople, uh, Turkey. Uh, Andrianople is also called Hadrianople, named for the Emperor Hadrian, for the Roman Emperor Hadrian, and no friend of ours, but that was the name of the city. In the Ottoman Empire, uh, now Edirne, uh, Turkey. He was born in 1508. He came from a family of Spanish emigres, uh, that is to say refugees from Spain in 1492. His father may well have been among those who fled uh, Spain. So his Spanish roots were... Uh, you know, immediate and as we will see, his associations uh, were within the Sephardi refugee community uh, in Sfat, uh, particularly. He died um, after uh, 1593, pr probably in the year 1593. Uh, the last evidence we have of his being alive is he participated in the Din Torah in uh, Damascus in Syria. Uh, though he is buried in the famous cemetery in Sfat, uh, the monument states that he died on 13 Nisan 1600, uh, but the evidence supports the earlier date, the date that you see here of 1593, and we find that in the writings of Maharit, uh, Maharit is of Yosef ben Moshe Trani, the son of the Mabit, who was a contemporary and a colleague of uh, al Sheikh. so we regard that generally as more reliable uh, even though what's written in stone you would hope would reflect the, the accurate record, but uh, not necessarily the case uh, in this instance. But in any, at any rate, anyone who has had the opportunity to visit the famous uh, old cemetery in Sfat uh, will have come across or will have had the opportunity at least to visit the kever of Rav Moshe al-Sheikh, and we'll learn a lot more about him, hopefully together in the next uh, 60 minutes or slightly less. Uh, the name uh, Al-Sheikh would seem to derive from the Arabic Sheikh, meaning elder or someone who is venerated, uh, but Chida, in his famous book, Shem HaGedolim, maintains it's actually the name of a Spanish city from which the family uh, originated before they were exiled in 1492. Uh, at a young age, he became attached to Rav Yosef Karo. Rav Yosef Karo, I'm sure you know, and his name is right here as well, Rav Yosef Karo is the author of the Shulchan Aruch. Uh, he is often known as the Beis Yosef after the name that he gave to his magnum opus. And actually, even in our discussion tonight, I may refer to him as Beis Yosef because he's often known by that name. He's also known as Maran, our rabbi, our teacher. So Rav Yosef Karo was, <clears throat> excuse me, the foremost Torah personality, certainly in the halachic realm uh, in his own lifetime and maybe subsequently as well. And he lived, Yosef Karo lived in Andrianople at the time that uh, Moshe Alshek was born and when he was growing up. Uh, Rav Yosef Karo was 20 years older than Moshe Alshek. He was born in 1488. And uh, we're not going to discuss Rav Yosef Karo at length because we did a lecture on about him, uh, I think, last year. So um, whether it's recorded, I can't say for sure, though it is on the Kesher um, YouTube channel if you want to, to see it there. But Rav Yosef Karo became like a father to Rav Moshe al Sheikh. Uh, Rav Moshe al Sheikh studied with Rav Yosef Karo in his yeshiva in Andrianople. 
uh, he went with him to um, Salonika. Uh, the Mechaber Maran with Yosef went from Andrianople to uh, Salonika. Salonika, you probably heard of Salonika. Today, you won't find any place called Salonika because that is the Turkish name. It has, is now known by its original Greek name, Thessaloniki. But uh, for hundreds of years, it was an important city in the Ottoman Empire, and it was a very important Jewish city as well. I have a fondness for Salonika because we took a Kesha trip there several years ago. Very uh, stirring, uh, captivating, and memorable trip. Uh, just a little advertisement for Salonika. Uh, if you'd ever like to travel there, if you ever can travel anywhere, hopefully uh, we'll be able to do that uh, before long. But uh, Salonika was an ear of Aim by Israel, a very important uh, city of uh, scholars, Torah scholars. And Rav Yosef Kara was among them for several years. And it's likely that Rav Moshe Alshech went as a young man, probably as a, as a teenager, possibly even, with Rav Yosef Karo to Salonika. And from Salonika, he followed him also to the land of Israel when they moved to Tzvat. And as I said, Maran raised him like a son. Alshech refers to the Beis Yosef as my father. And he remained a disciple of the Beis Yosef for more than 50 years until the latter's death in 1575, when Rav Yosef Karo passed away. And in fact, Rav Moshe al-Sheikh succeeded the Beis Yosef as the Av Basin of Tzvat uh, in, in 1575 with the passing of the, the great uh, sage. So they were very close and he, Rav Moshe al-Sheikh, became like the leading, the prized disciple of the great Rav Yosef Karo. Uh, the influx of Spanish exiles brought growth and prosperity, wisdom, uh, talent, and energy to Tzvat. Uh, they sought out Tzvat. I need to mention it as a very poignant just at the moment, but they sought out Tzvat in the north, in the Galil, because of its proximity to Meron. Of course, Meron is the burial place of Rosh Hashim by Yochai, uh, it's recalled now for, for the tragedy of this past Lagba Omer as we know. But Neron was and remains a small town, a village, but Rav Shema Bar Yochai is buried there, and because of that, Tzvat, which was sort of the closest substantial settlement, became a magnet for sages, scholars, Kabbalists, especially, as we shall see. And uh, that's why Tzvat became like a, a um, uh, drawing uh, a, a magnet really for, for great people, especially Spanish exiles, who often made their way not directly to Tzfat, but often through North Africa, via North Africa, or via the Ottoman Empire uh, more, more commonly. Uh, so Tzfat was uh, prosperous at that time, and the, the uh, personalities who lived there are like a who's who of the greatest Torah sages uh, of, the, of the era. Uh, it was run by uh, what was called the Beis Havad, uh, which was essentially a kind of rabbinic board, probably some lay leadership as well. And they ran the town and uh, they exercised a great deal of influence uh, throughout the land of Israel and indeed throughout the Jewish world. Uh, the personalities at that time on the base in Tzfat were of Yaakov Beirav, uh, Rav Yosef Karo, of course, and Mabit. Uh, Mabit is Rav Moshe, Yo Rav Moshe Ben Yosef Trani, that's Mabit, Moshe Ben Yosef Trani, from the Italian town of Trani originally. And that was the leading based in, in the East, in the Ottoman Empire, and possibly throughout the world. Uh, they uh, issued proclamations and rulings. Their rulings were sought for Jewish communities literally around the world, uh, in, in Europe and mean especially, certainly in North Africa as well, but Ashkenazic lands also. In fact, Rav Yosef Kara had a correspondence even with the Rama in Krakow, but we're not going to talk about that now. It's worthwhile to mention a little bit about the Smicha controversy. Um, I'm not sure whether that is even mentioned in this little paragraph that you can see here that we have on the screen. Um, but I must tell you about the fascinating uh, subject of the Smicha controversy. In 1538, Rav Yaakov Beirav uh, uh, implemented a plan that he had, and that plan was the following. He was born in Castile in 1474. Rav Yaakov Beirav was therefore 14 years older than Rav Yosef Karo, 
he was the uh, leading senior elder uh, scholar, Tamar Chacham, Posek, uh, in Tzfat, again, among uh, uh, a generation of outstanding Torah personalities. And he was much traveled. He uh, started in Spain. He was in Andrianople, I think. He was in Cairo. He was in Jerusalem. Traveled a lot. And he finally made his way to Tzfat, where he uh, settled. He was the Avbeistim. And he devised a plan to renew smicha. Smicha, in the classic sense, refers to the transmission of ordination from teacher to student, from one sage to the next generation, stretching back to the Nevi'im and back to Moshe Rabbeinu. And the institution of smicha was uh, well um, documented until the days of the Tanaim, even after the Choban Habayis, it still continued, but under Roman persecution, it petered out around the 4th or 5th centuries. Smicha could only be given in the land of Israel, and one could only get smicha by someone who has received smicha. And that person in turn must have received the smicha from the previous generation. Now, the relevance of this is not only to be like a certified, uh, you know, uh, uh, accredited rabbi, it was much more than that. It meant that such a person could uh, uh, preside over a base din that was authorized to, uh, um, like, administer or legislate for different types of punishments, corporal punishment, uh, kanasos, which are certain types of penalties mentioned in the Torah, even in principle, capital punishment as well. A based in that are not smuchim, that are not part of this chain of tradition, their rulings have a more limited impact. And there are certain types of, of um, sentences that they cannot even uh, hand down. Or if they do, they don't have the authority of Torah law, but maybe some kind of rabbinic uh, uh, requirement. But beyond the technicalities of it, there's something much more profound as well. Because we spoke last week, and even the week before, even a bit more, when we spoke about Abarbanel, how the Jewish world, especially the Spaniards themselves, the Jewish uh, Spanish refugees, were absolutely traumatized by the expulsion from Spain in 1492. Historians can trace the background to it, and we've even discussed it a little bit ourselves in that shiur, as to how it came about. But at the time, it caught them completely by surprise. Jews had lived in Spain for many, many centuries, for um, 1,500 years, maybe as, as long as 2,000 years. The idea that their um, position and their, their standing in Spain would be so compromised to the point that they would be forced to choose between baptism and exile was something that they did not anticipate. And they were traumatized by it to the point that they were certain that the only meaning that can be um, like uh, uh, advanced to explain and to give some some value, some positive in, in, significance to the trauma that overcame them, the terrible tragedy and the suffering and the torture of the Spanish Inquisition, the only explanation can be the war of Gog and Magog. It must be the birth pains of the Messiah, the Chevle Mashiach. That is how they understood it, which meant there was an intense messianic fervor that caught hold and spread throughout the Jewish world, especially, as I keep saying, among the Megurashe Sfarad themselves. And that is part of why they wanted to come to the land of Israel. They thought the time has come. The ingathering of the exiles is finally at hand. If we've been driven from our from our ancestral homeland, it can only be because Hashem is telling us it's time to come home. So therefore, they began to return, not in, in statistically large numbers, but if we speak about the quality, the standing, the stature, the greatness of those um, uh individuals and families that came to Eretz Israel, so we have among many of the greatest person. In fact, Yosef Karo himself uh, had a Magid, a kind of celestial um, communicator, an angel, who would appear to him in dreams and tell him 
instruct him and urge him in different things. The Magi told him it's time to go to Eretz Yisrael, and so he did. That's why they went to Tzvat, because Tzvat is near Meron. Meron, of course, is the burial place, as we mentioned, of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the author of the Zohar, the fount of Jewish mysticism, and the, the means through which the messianic advent would be precipitated. This was their thinking. The idea of renewing the smicha was part of that, because the smicha would be the forerunner of the Sanhedrin, and the Pesach says, which he quoted the Pesach from Yeshaya in the first chapter of Yeshaya, Va'ashiva shavtaich kevari shona, I shall restore your judges as at first, v'yoatsaich kevatchila, and your advisors, or your counselors, as in the beginning. Acharei ken yikarei lecha ir hatzedek, and after that, you will be described as a city of righteousness, kirya ne'emana, a, a, a faithful settlement. That is to say, Yerushalayim will be restored to its glory after the restoration of the judges and the counselors. Rav Yaakov Beirav was convinced that this process of restoring, of renewing the smicha, would facilitate, would like, would jumpstart this process. Moreover, there was a more, if you like, personal and urgent consideration, and that was that he and so many of his contemporaries were living under the shadow, the dark shadow of the traumatic experiences of the uh, exposure from Spain. And so many of their contemporaries actually succumbed to the baptismal font. They kissed the cross to save their lives or the lives of their families or their children. And they escaped when they were able to do so. But what about that fact that they, in their own minds, committed such a terrible transgression? the way to expiate that was through lashes because the Talmud says that a punishment of karet, of spiritual excision can be expiated through lashes. If such a person receives lashes administered by the court, not just by a friend or something like that, but formally, uh, let's say, uh, condemned or sentenced to lashes by the court, it might be painful, but it will gain the, the um, convict, the forgiveness, the atonement, the expiation of his sin, and they craved that, they yearned for it, and they felt that this is part of the messianic event as well. All of this is the background to the Smicha controversy. Of course, I'm sure you're asking, you're wondering, I hope you are, how is it possible to revive something that had fallen into desuetude for a thousand years? The answer is based on a somewhat idiosyncratic passage in the Rambam. The Rambam writes in Mishnah Torah, if anyone wants to make a note of it, you can look it up, in the Laws of Sanhedrin, chapter 4, Mish, uh, Halacha 11. There the Rambam writes that if all of the sages of the land of Israel agree to bestow smicha on a particular individual, then it could be possible that their authority, their collective authority, representing all the sages of the land of Israel, would have the authority to renew the smicha. It fell into the suetu, but it can be renewed if such a thing were to occur. Now, the Rambam may have um, imagined that, that such a possibility is unlikely to occur, um, or maybe he thought it perhaps will occur. He adds uh, uh, something completely uncharacteristic for the Rami says, the matter requires further study or further like uh, uh, de determination. It's not like the Rambam. Anyone who has picked up the writings of the Rambam will find that he generally writes with great self-confidence and great definitiveness. It doesn't say like we find in the Shulchan Aruch and the two or many other sources, some say like this and some say like this. Well, this is recommended, but um, Bidiyavid, you can do it this way. He does have such an idea of Mechadchil and Bidiyavid, but the idea that some say this or some say that, and there's a compromise opinion or something like that, we don't find that in the Rambam. He makes up his mind and he tells you what the halacha is in his view. This is uncommon. He says, Adain Tzarech Hechra, the matter requires further study. At any rate, the Rambam does propose this idea Says Rav Yaakov Bey Rav in 1538, the time has come. He gathered together 25 rabbis of Tzvat 
and at his kind of um, instruction, the 25 of them gave smicha to him. And he in turn gave smicha to, uh, the, to, to the base Yosef, Rav Yosef Karo. Rav Yosef Karo in turn gave smicha to the Moshe Alshech. Rav Moshe Alshech was the prized Talmud of Rav Yosef Karo, and he gave him smicha, and on the kever, on the tombstone of Rav Moshe Alshech, you can see it in Svat when you visit, it says, Husmach al Gidein Maran. He received ordination through uh, to the hands of Maran, that's the, the Beis Yosef, and uh, he was one of those people representing, if you like, the third generation. That is to say, Yaakov Beirav gave smicha to Rav Yosef Karo, who was 14 years younger than him, but they were newly contemporaries. Moshe Alshech would be the next generation, as we'll see, Rav Moshe Alshech gave smicha to someone else as well. Uh, although it's not strictly part of the biographical sketch of Rav Moshe Alshech, but I must tell you more about the smicha controversy because it does have implications for the excuse me, for the Jewish community in Tzfat and in the land of Israel at that time. This idea touched off enormous and bitter controversy. There was personal animus and invective between of Yaakov Beirav, who was determined, he was uh, a great person, but he was like vigorous to the point of obstinacy. On the one hand, and a man called Reb Levi Ibn Chaviv of uh, Yerushalayim. Reb Levi Ibn Chaviv is known in the rabbinic tradition as Maharal Bach. It's a slightly uh, um, unwieldy Roshay Tevas, Maharal Bach. Moreno Harav uh, Levi Ibn Chaviv. So Reb Levi Ibn Chaviv was the Av based in Yerushalayim. And they had met in Yerushalayim and they had some dealings. They didn't get along very well. But Rav Yaakov Beirav thought that he'll try a kind of charm offensive. It did not work well. The charm offensive was that when he gave smicha to four people, Rav Yosef Karo, the Mabit, and the other two are not that well known. We don't even know for certain exactly who they are. He also gave smicha at that time remotely to this Rav Levi Ibn Chaviv. So he uh, they had like a ceremony and he was not there. This lady uh, uh, was not there, but they wrote him up a smicha document. They sent it UPS or uh, DHL. They sent it to uh, to Yerushalayim. Uh, and Rav Yaakov Beira was hoping that in this way he would win the support of Rav, Rav Ibn Chaviv. Where it did not work that well. It did not work that way at all. He said, I don't think much of you or your smicha. You never even sought our approval, and this whole thing is a uh, is a um, misguided and uh, uh, you know um, completely uh, un unworthy exercise. The Rambam himself says a dain tzarechecha. Even the Rambam himself is not sure. The Ramban and all the others disagree with the Rambam. So the Rambam is a das yachid. Besides which, the Rambam writes. We mentioned if all the sages of the land of Israel agreed to give smicha to a certain person, he says, you didn't even ask us. I don't agree. You didn't ask me. You didn't ask any of my based in. And in any case, if there is a, a based in or a community that symbolizes the entire community of the land of Israel, it's going to be Yerushalayim, not some village on a mountaintop in the Galil. So he was considered to be an affront to his authority, to his dignity, and to the, the dignity of Yerushalayim itself. So he also, when he wrote back, he made it clear, reading between the lines, that he, he thinks that Rav Yaakov Beirav is really not, not up to much, and he, he's, you know, overreached himself. Rav Yaakov Beirav, I told you, though, uh, was a strong personality, and he replied to Lady Ibn Chaviv, I never changed my name. In the midst of want and despair, I went in God's way, among other things. This, my friends, was a cutting allusion to the fact that Maharal Bach with Laban Khabib, when he was a lad, when he was a youth in Portugal, he changed his name and he lived as a Christian for a year. 
So when he says, I never changed my name, and despite the want and despair, I went in God's way. So this already became a very personal vendetta. The invective, the bitterness, the, the personal antagonism uh, was very nasty. Uh, Mahari Be, uh, uh, Beirav, Mahari Beirav uh, has been described as a man who had many admirers, but few friends. And therefore, uh, people did not rush necessarily to his defense, although he did have those who also sought to uh, reinstate the smicha system. But in addition to all of that, his life was now in danger because uh, Maharal Bach ibn Khavid let, and his supporters in Yerushalayim, they let it be known to the Turkish authorities that this project in Tzfat, they have a plan to reinstitute the Sanhedrin and to start an independent Jewish state. Well, that's all the Turks needed to hear. They put out a warrant for his arrest uh, uh, for Yaakov Beirab, and his life was literally uh, at risk. Besides that, he was very wealthy. So if the Turks had arrested him and executed him, they would have seized all of his assets. This was, this was a great prize. So basically, he had to flee, and he fled to Egypt. And by the time he returned to Tzfat some years later, his dream had turned to dust, and we hear nothing more of it. In fact, even the personalities that I've mentioned, uh, Beis Yosef, Mabit, Rav Moshe Alshech, they don't talk about it at all. We do, and, and they wrote voluminously. They don't, even Rav Yosef Karo, in his parish on the Mishnah Torah, I hope you know he wrote a parish on Mishnah Torah, Beis Yosef wrote a parish on Mishnah Torah called Kesef Mishnah, written by Rav Yosef Kara. And that halacha, just bland, he doesn't say anything about what happened. He wants to forget the whole incident, so it would, would seem. Okay, let's talk about the writings of uh, Ramosha al Sheikh. So I told you that he was a Talmud of, uh, the, the prized Talmud of the Beis Yosef. He succeeded him as the Av Beistin of the most important Beistin in, in, in the East, maybe in, in the entire Jewish world. He was obviously a halachic scholar of the highest order. And although we remember him, as we'll soon see, as a darshan, but in his lifetime, he was very active in halachic affairs, running the based in and being essentially the, the, um, uh, a key player in this very important community, which numbered, according to some reckonings, I suspect is an exaggeration, but numbered as many as 5,000 souls which was a large, large number of Jews for, for a Jewish community in Eretz Yisrael at that time. Uh, his chuvas have been published, Chuvas al Sheikh. There are 140 chuvas published there, uh, including many others that were not published. Um, an interesting one is a chuva regarding uh, or, or opposing Azariah de Rassi. Azariah de Rassi is known as Azariah min ha'adumim, and uh, he wrote a sefer called Maore Naim. He was the uh, scholar that many of his contemporaries loved to hate. He was a, a learned person, I think we could say he was a Talmud Chacham, uh, but he had a lot of original ideas. He was a sort of product of the Italian Renaissance, and he had a lot of quite original ideas. He was denounced by Maharal. We'll talk about Maharal when we get to him in two weeks' time, or three weeks' time. Um, and uh, this uh, Ramosh al Sheikh also, at the behest of the Beis Yosef, he wrote a tshuva uh, critiquing and, and essentially uh, uh, exoriating Azaria de Rassi, whose famous book Moore 9 is available, can be translated into English as well. His primary study, he writes himself in the introduction to his parish, al Sheikh writes, that my primary study was Shas and Poskim, and he is quoted by Chida, by Prima Gami, by Rabbi Kida Eger. He says, only, ha only on Friday did I take time for Mikra studies and for Medrash, uh, probably to prepare his drushas. Now, let's talk about how he became such a famous darshan. By the way, you can see here the, uh, uh, the um, Charblat. This is certainly not the first printing. The first printing, actually, I think it was in 1593, the first uh, uh, it was first published in Constantinople in 1593, the uh, commentary on Voracious. It was published in full, I think, a few years later in, I think, 1601. But in any case, this is a sharp lot you can see right in front of you, if you're looking at the screen, uh, from, uh, from Warsaw. It was re has been reprinted many times, and uh, 
This is the famous uh, Ramosha Al Sheikh, his parish, and we're going to talk more about the exact name which he gave it shortly. But let's talk about how he became a darshan. There's a lovely legend of how he became a darshan. Again, I say once more, his uh, stature was as a posek, as a halachist. But according to the legend, it was revealed to Rabbi Yosef Karo that the Alshech had merited to perceive one of the 70 facets of the Torah. I'm sure you're familiar with the famous tradition. There are 70 facets, Shivin Panim La Torah, 70 facets to the Torah. So the Beis Yosef uh, learned through a divine revelation, or through his Magi probably, that the uh, that Alshech had been had merited to perceive one of the 70 facets of the Torah. In other words, uh, one of the legitimate, authoritative 70 interpretations of every passage or every word has been revealed to, to the al -Shik. And thereupon, he, he insisted the next Shabbos that the al should give a drasha, which he was very reluctant to do because uh, the Yosef used to be the darshan, he was the av so he used to give the, the drasha. He said, no, you've got to do it. And so he did, and he uh, drew large crowds and he would speak at great length and uh, according to what he writes he would record them after shabbos but these drushes probably went down easily for an hour or two or three um, because that was the style in those days and he would pepper them with illustrations with mishalim with madrashim and this this sort of thing so uh his uh parish uh, on, on the torah is a uh, condensation or selection he claims he insists that he uh like uh, condensed it, he left out all the repetition, and he almost uh, sort of regrets that his space only allowed him uh, to record a fraction of his output. But actually, his out his written output is still very extensive. We'll talk about that uh, shortly. His leading disciple, you've got it here in front of you as well, if you're looking at your screen, was Reb Chaim Vital. I'm sure you know that Reb Chaim Vital was the famous Kabbalist, the leading disciple and amanuensis of the Ari. The Ari is our subject for next week, so we'll save the Ari for then. But Rav Chaim Vital was the primary disciple of the Ari. He was also the great disciple of al -Shikh. We could say that he was the leading disciple of the Ari in Kabbalah and the leading Talmud of Ramosha al -Shikh in everything else, in Halacha, in Talmud, in, in, in everything else in Nigla, as, as we, we, might, we might describe it. And uh, he granted smicha to Rokhaim Vital in 1590. As far as we know, Rokhaim Vital was the last person to get smicha from this aborted uh, effort. Uh, probably, this is my speculation, Rav Alshech gave smicha to Rokhaim Vital in 1590 when he, Rav Moshe Alshev, was already, um, as you can see here, 82 years old, excuse me, in, 19, in 1590. But moreover, he was setting out on a journey, a perilous journey. And he may, it may well be he thought that he needs to transmit the smicha to someone else in Sfat in order to carry on the tradition, uh, the, the, the chain. I suspect that Rav Chaim Vital himself uh, was a lot more interested in Kabbalah, certainly at that time, than he was in uh, Smicha controversy and taking up the cudgels and that sort of thing. And as far as history records, Rukhain Vital did not transmit the Smicha to, to anyone, as, as far as we are aware. Which brings us to the very interesting question, excuse me, of the al and Kabbalah. So it says here, that he is properly referred to as al commentator and Kabbalist. The suggestion that Ramosha al was a Kabbalist is almost a presumption uh, because he was the Rebbe of the great, great Kabbalist of Chaim Vital. He was contemporary, actually he was older than the Ari. The Ari died, we'll talk next week, at a very young age. Uh, he lived in Tzfat at the same time as Rav Moshe Cordovero, who was the great Kabbalist before the Ari. Rav Yosef Karo also was a great Kabbalist. Some of the other personalities, uh, we may mention them next week, were also great Mekubalim. If he was the Av Beistin, if he was the coast Talmud for 50 years of the Beis Yosef, if he received Smicha from the Beis Yosef, 
he must have been a Kabbalist as well. Well, I'm not disputing that, but the fact is that his Perush does not deal with Kabbalah. He only occasionally quotes the Zohar, and even then it's just like as, as a medrash, not in terms of uh, the, the Kabbalistic principles. So many have said that even though he doesn't like uh, present Kabbalistic interpretations, but his whole worldview is rooted in Kabbalah. Well, that is quite possible. Um, he was familiar with the Kabbalah of the, of the Ramak, Ramosha Kodavero, but probably not through Ramosha Kodavero, but through the brother-in-law of Ramosha Kodavero. I hope you've heard of him. His name was Roshloma Alkavetz. Roshloma Alkavetz is well known to us because his words are on our lips every week. He was the author of L'Chadodi. What greater literary legacy can anyone hope for than to be the author of the Chadodi, which we sing all over the Jewish world every Friday night? But Roshloma Alkavetz was not just a beautiful chazan and a poet, he was a profound and leading Kabbalist. He was the, the, the Rebbe of Rav Moshe Cordovero, his brother in law in Kabbalah. He was the Rebbe of Rav Yosef Karo in Kabbalah. And probably he was the Rebbe of uh, Al Sheikh in Kabbalah as well, this Rushoma Al Kabbalah. But Lurianic, so called Lurianic Kabbalah, is much more profound, it's more flashy, and it's more, uh, it took the Jewish world by storm and continues to do so even now, all of these centuries later. Uh, I suspect it's my theory, uh, we don't have enough documentary evidence to verify. My suspicion is that. Rev that Rav Alshech went on Aliyah from Salonika together with the Beis Yosef and together with Rishlam Alkavitz also because he also he was born in, in Salonika Rishlam Alkavitz and he also went to Tzfat. I suspect they, they all went they all went together. The Ari told the Alshech that Kabbalah is not for you. He said you you came into the world to perfect or to elevate the Takain. Pshat, in other words, to elevate the pshat to drash, that's what you came to do. That's your, your avoda, that's your purpose in this world. Not for Kabbalah. He was reluctant to accept the Moshe al Sheikh as a Talmud for, for, for the teachings of Kabbalah. In the Shibchei Ha'ari, there's a story in which he, the Ari, told the Moshe al Sheikh, you, uh, like explored or you you mastered Kabbalah in a previous Gilgul, in a previous reincarnation when you were Chutzpis Hamaturgaman. Chutzpis Hamaturgaman was one of the ten martyrs, the ten Harugei Malchus, and you were this Chutzpis Hamaturgaman in a previous life, and that's when you were into Kabbalah. Kabbalah is not for you this time around. By the way, it is said that he, Rav Moshe was also a Gilgul of Ravina the redactor of the Talmud, among the very greatest and most important Amorayim. So when it came to Gilgul, he was well, well positioned, but the Ari said, Kabbalah is not for you. Uh, there's another story which is related by Rav Chaim Vital himself um, in his book called Chizionos, um, I think. Uh, he says, on one occasion, al was a bit uh, down. You know, his countenance showed that he was distressed. So a certain widow, known as Rachel Ashkenazis, asked him why. So he said, because my student, Rav Chaim Vital, refuses to instruct me in the teachings of the Ari. After the latter's death, the Ari had already died. And he said, he told her that uh, the, uh, my, my Talmud, he's my, my own Talmud, he refuses to, to instruct me. And um, she said, is the student greater than the master? You're upset that he won't teach you. He's your your Talmud. So uh, he Ramash Ashik replied, "When I asked the Ari himself to initiate me into the secrets of the Kabbalah, he said to me, speak to Rav Chaim Vital because I, he's my Talmud. I'm teaching everything to him. If you want to learn, you can you can learn it from him." So I said to the Ari, it's uncomfortable for me to seek instruction from my disciple. So the Ari said, you wish that you were worthy of being his disciple in Kabbalah. So you can see that the Ramosh al Sheikh was getting the put down from the Ari and the, the brush off every time. According to other sources, though, 
uh, in the writings of Rechaim Vital himself, Alshich commanded him with the authority of the Torah to reveal to him his studies with the Ari. In other words, the, the Ari had not been uh, like um, had not uh, come into the public domain with his greatness. As we'll see next week, he was a young man, the Ari, who had only lived in Tzfat for about two and a half years. He died at the age of 38. And he came as a businessman when he first arrived in Tzfat. So it took some time before even his greatness was recognized of the Ari. But Ramosha al realized that his Tamar of Chaim Vital is spending a lot of time with Ari. So he said, what's going on? He didn't want to say. He said, I command you with the, the, the instruction of the Torah. I'm your rabbi. I'm, I'm, I'm demanding. So he revealed, and then the, uh, then Reb Moshe went to the Ari, uh, and they say that the Ari he did was a Talmud Ari for a certain time, a short while, maybe not for long, and whenever he sat into the lecture, he went into a trance, and he could remember very little. So these are all legends, but these suggest the, the reality, or these help to shed light on the fact that in the writings of the Moshe Al Sheikh. There's very little, almost nothing of uh, Kabbalah that, that we would say this shows or reflects the influence of the, of the writings or the teachings of Yari, which is surprising, uh, you know, in, in many ways. Um, so what are his writings about then? Musar, ethics, uh, philosophy, exhortations to piety, spirituality, charity, uh, inspiration, homilies. His style is reminiscent of that of Abarbanel, where he begins each section with a series of questions, six, eight, 10, 12 questions, sometimes more. Um, he's fairly prolix, he's quite wordy, although he claims, as I said earlier, to have shortened them considerably from the oral, you know, uh, uh, original. Because they are so, he writes at such length, puts people off a bit. A number of kitsurim have been published, but it remains a rich trove of material for uh, Darshanin, for Abanim, and for students. And he has a very um, accessible style. He writes in, a, in an easily accessible style. As I said, he doesn't do Kabbalah. He doesn't do difficult philosophy. So it's written in a, in a style which can easily be, be grasped by the, by the student. Now, I want to tell you an interesting thought about the name by which he is known. So. Uh, just looking here in this paragraph, if it is even mentioned here. Yeah, uh, in the middle of this paragraph, you have in the upper left quadrant, his important commentary on the Torah, Torah Moshe, gained great popularity and it became known as Al Sheikh HaKadosh. So he is known as Al Sheikh HaKadosh, the Holy Al Sheikh, and his commentary on the Torah is called Al Sheikh. If you take a look, at what you see hopefully right in front of you, Sefer Torah's Moshe Bereshis, Moshe al -Sheikh. What is the name of his parish though? The name is Torah's Moshe. So it's very interesting that I once heard from Rabbi Nachman Bulman, for those who ever, ever came across him, a very interesting observation. I don't know whether it, his, whether it was his own or he read it elsewhere. There are three great personalities, outstanding Torah personalities, who wrote very important Torah um, works. And the Jewish world has been very reluctant to call those books by the names given by their authors. The Rambam wrote a book called Mishneh Torah. But until maybe 100 years ago, it was rarely known as Mishneh Torah. It was called by the nickname that the Rambam himself gave it, which was Yad HaChazaka. But the actual name the Rambam gave it, which is Mishneh Torah, we've been reluctant to use. Because the Rambam himself writes in the introduction why he gave it that name, Mishneh Torah, a second Torah. He said, because now you can read the Torah, the five books of the Torah of Moshe Rabbeinu. And you can read my book, the Mishneh Torah, like the second, the companion to the Torah. You don't need anything in between. In other words, he was trying to supersede the Talmud. And because he called it Mishneh Torah, we have been reluctant to use it, by, call it by that name. With all of the greatness of the Rambam and all of the greatness of the book Mishneh Torah, that name is just going a little bit too far. It's just a little bit too, uh, like, um, 
self-assured. The other one is this Ramosha al -Sheikh. He was very great. He's known as al Sheikh HaKodesh, but he called his book Torah's Moshe. You know, there is only one real Torah's Moshe. So the fact that he, okay, his name was Moshe al -Sheikh, but still to call his parish Torah's Moshe, going a bit too far. So maybe that's why he's known as al Sheikh HaKadosh, and even his his commentary is known as al Sheikh HaKadosh. The third one is a Hassam Sofer. Hassam Sofer, the great Rabbi Moshe Sofer, or Moshe Schreiber, Hassam Sofer, we call him and we call his books by the name Hassam Sofer. Hassam is not the real name he gave it. He gave the name Chidushe Toras Moshe. Chatam, Chidushe Toras Moshe. But we don't normally call it by that name, Chidushe Toras Moshe. It's again going a bit too far. We call it Hassam Sofer. Hassam Sofer. This was Rabbi Bowman's uh, uh, comment that I heard from him. Um, many years ago. But in any rate, there are only a very small number of great, great personalities who are known as HaKadosh, or HaChaim HaKadosh, with Chaim Ibn Atar, Perush on the Torah, the Ari HaKadosh. We have Rabbeinu HaKadosh. Rabbeinu HaKadosh is with Yehuda HaNasi. I saw a suggestion which I think is quite uh, attractive, actually, that the Ari, that Chaim Vital writes that he had a vision in which he beheld the greatest of the Tanayim. He saw what they looked like. Rabbi Huda Hanasi, Rabbeinu HaKadosh, who looked like the al -Sheikh. That's what he writes. So maybe that's why al -Sheikh became known as al -Sheikh HaKadosh, because he looked similar to, and his greatness maybe was an echo of the great Rabbeinu HaKadosh. In any case, he is known as al -Sheikh HaKadosh. By the end of his life, uh, or I should say at the end of his life, uh, in the 1580s, the Tzfat, uh, the good times had come to an end. I said Tzfat was uh, prosperous, it was growing. Uh, maybe too many kolo yungalite and not enough uh, wage earners. I'm sure combination of factors, but uh, Tzfat was in desperation by the late 1580s. Poverty, starvation, contagion, <clears throat> onerous taxation exploitation and mismanagement by the Turks. Because unlike Jerusalem or Hebron, Tzfat means nothing to the Muslims. So they had no interest in, in investing in it or helping it in any way. So Tzfat had fallen on hard times. People had left, people had died. The numbers dwindled from 5,000 to 400. I saw in one place, I don't know how reliable it is, but they were desperate. The, the poverty and the, the starvation brought them to their knees. And they dispatched on a fundraising mission. To me, it's, I don't know if it's shocking or, or astonishing. Ramosha al was the Av based in, the Rosh Yeshiva, the Darshan. He was 82 years old. And they sent him on a fundraising mission as a Meshulach. On Rosh Chodesh Av of 1590, he set out for Turkey, for Syria, possibly even Persia. He spent all of 1592 in Constantinople. In 1593, he was in Damascus. He wanted to travel to Venice, Italy, again, on the fundraising mission, but he was too weak. He wrote a blockbuster fundraising letter to Italian Jewry called Chazut Kasha, a, a painful vision, which was published in 1593, I think in Damascus, uh, with 10 reasons why they should support the Kehila in Tzfat. This was in days before charity and crowdfunding. Uh, so this is what he wrote, a blockbuster fundraising letter. And it was actually republished in Jerusalem, I think, in the 1970s as well. Chazut, Chazut Kasha. But he was too weak. I mean, by this time, he was, uh, you do the math, in 1593. He was born in 1508. He was 85 years old. And he just was too weak to travel to, to Italy. And he died a short time after that, probably in 1593. Probably he died in Damascus, um, although we, some say he made it. He made his way back to Tzfat, but in any case, uh, he is buried in Tzfat. And as I said, one can visit his his kefir uh, on a, if you were able to visit Tzfat. Um, he had a shul where he was probably the rabbi in that shul. Uh, which was founded by immigrants from Turkey, by, by, by him and his, his contemporaries, called the Kamis Istanbula. 
It was renamed Al Sheikh in his honor after his death in 1593. And maybe in his merit, who can say it was one of the very few buildings to survive the devastating earthquake in Tzfat of 1759 and another one in 1837. Those two earthquakes, uh, uh, each one devastated most of the buildings in Tzfat, uh, but that was one of the few that, that uh, uh, remained uh, standing and I don't know if it was damaged, but it was, you know, it, it was still standing and did not, would, did not have to be rebuilt. Uh, it's pretty impressive for a 300 year old building. You can still visit it today as well when you visit uh, Tzfat. He wrote extensively on most of Tanakh. Um, he wrote on um, Mishle, Tehillim, Daniel. He wrote on the five Megillo as well. Um, and uh, it's interesting. I said that he uh, steers away from Kabbalah, which is true in all of his writings. In Shir Hashirim is the one partial exception in which he says that the interpretation of Shir Hashirim, the pshat, the simple understanding, he says is, is too misleading with all of the passionate imagery of uh, love and beauty and, and uh, associated impulses. The sim simple understanding, he said, is too easily misinterpreted. And he said the, the uh, sort of Kabbalistic understanding is, is too profound and too, too difficult, too easily misunderstood as well. And he says, therefore, he's providing an allegorical interpretation as a kind of middle path between, between the two. Uh, also, his commentary on Pirkei Avot has been published also on Haggadah Shel Pesach, although probably those are not original. They've been um, anthologized from his other, collected from his other writings. So he wrote a few, he published a few of these books in his lifetime. Most of them were published in the generation after his death by his son uh, Chaim, uh, Chaim al -Sheikh, and several other disciples. Several condensed versions of his Torah commentary have appeared as well. And by the way, it is available in English also. There are, num there are some English versions available also. I know our time is just about up, and I do want to have an opportunity for some questions, but I would like to end with a couple of citations, examples of his writings, some of very beautiful, just brief thoughts, excuse me, called from his writings. And actually, you've got them here on this page as well. So let's take a look at. This one in the, sorry about those lines, not quite sure why we wrote that. Um, okay, if the journey is too great for you so that you are not able to carry it, this is talking about Maasa Sheni, a certain portion of the crop, a tenth of the crop in certain years has to be brought to Yerushalayim. But if the journey is too great for you so that you are not able to carry it because the place is too far from you, which the Lord your God has chosen as a site, when the Lord your God has blessed you. So the mitzvah here that the Torah is telling us is the mitzvah of Maser Sheni and Pidyon, the possibility of selling the uh, produce for silver, bringing the silver to Yerushalayim, and buying food and drink with the silver in Yerushalayim. It's good for the local economy as well that way. Says Rav Aushech, a very beautiful thought. If you're not able to carry it, if you approach a task with enthusiasm and eagerness, it will never be too difficult for you to accomplish. He's interpreting this uh, midrashically. The journey is too great. It's too far for you to schlep all of this, uh, the produce, the pomegranates and the olives and the grapes and bushels and bushels. It's too much for you to, to dig. It's too, too far. It's too heavy to carry. Says Aushech, if you approach with enthusiasm and eagerness, it will never be too difficult for you to accomplish. The same task done with indifference and a listless attitude will prove to be an unbearable burden. If the journey is too great for you, if you find the journey intolerably long and you are not able to carry it because the burden is too heavy for you to carry, that's an indication that Kirchak Mimcha Hamakom. Hamakom is a remise to God Himself. Like we say, um, Trying to think of a, of, a, of a more favorable example, but of course we use it in, in, a, in a greeting to a to the bereaved. Hamakom in Achem. We use Hamakom in other more positive ways as well. Anyway, Hamakom is one of the covenants for Hashem Himself. So He says, "Ki Hamakom." It must be that God is too far from you. 
Because if you were close to God, if you felt Hashem in your life, then you would not despair. You would not feel the journey is too far. The burden is too great. You would never feel that way. If you have the enthusiasm and the confidence and the sense that Hashem is with you, then you'll always be able to do the task. The feeling, on the contrary, that is the burden is too heavy, the journey is too long, is because you because Hashem is far from you. You you don't have the enthusiasm that that you should have, and if and and it must only be that Hashem is far from you. I uh, just look at one other example together, and that is here. Uh, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was perfectly righteous, was perfectly righteous man in his generation. Okay, very well. No, Noah ish tzadik. Tamim haya, Noah ish tzadik. Tamim haya b'darasav es ha'elohim hisalech Noah. Now, of course, much is said about the fact that Noah was righteous in his generations. Very well known, but Al Sheikh has a different take on it, which I find very beautiful. He says, Noah walked with God. Great to walk with God. And I'm sure that it is. I mean, I don't want to anyway uh, um, downgrade such a description. Nevertheless, as it's very well known, uh, Noah is, the sages do find a bit of fault with Noah. Let's take a look at what the Alshif says. Noah was perfectly righteous man in his generation. Noah walked with God. The Gentile nations are called B'nai Noach. Almost all of them are B'nai Noach. All of mankind are all B'nai Noach. The Jewish people, we identify ourselves as B'nai Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Of course, we're also B'nai Noach because Noach is the progenitor of all mankind. So really, the designation B'nai Noach is applicable to the Jewish people as well. Why are we called specifically B'nai Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov? So he says, yes, Noah was perfectly righteous man. He did not exemplify a Jewish tzaddik. He is the epitome of a tzaddik of the righteous Gentiles. He was among the chassidim almost ha'olam. He is the epitome of a tzaddik. Why? Because Noah walked with God, but not with his fellow man. In other words, his righteousness took the form of distancing himself from man in order to walk with God. Now, what he is alluding to here is the Christian, although he lived among Muslims in Tzfat, but remember, he came from a, 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 from a family of Spanish emigres who lived for generations with the Catholics, the Dominicans and the Franciscans, and Catholicism, especially the form of that was practiced in Spain at that time, which was a very severe, austere, rigorous, uh, sometimes uh, uh, obsessive form of religion, that the, the priests, the monks, they separated themselves from man. They, so to speak, in their own thinking, walked with God, but not with man. He says, so Noah was that kind of, he epitomized the, the Gentile tzaddik. He walked with God, and was, he was not concerned with the suffering of mankind. His righteousness was focused on himself for his benefit and not of his family. When God commanded him, to build, we'll just go to the rest of it here, an ark, he obediently built it, board by board, nail by nail for 120 years. It never occurred to him to pray to have the decree annulled and to save the world from annihilation. Now, by the way, the Medrash seems to say it probably never occurred to him. He just was not successful in his efforts to pray. But in any case, the Torah doesn't mention that he prayed for the nations of the world. Abraham's attitude was the exact opposite. He tried to improve mankind. Abraham converted men, while Sarah converted women. He taught the world monotheism, ethics, and morality. And when God announced his intention of wiping out Sodom, Abraham fervently prayed to save these wicked people. So the al says that we are called Bani Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov because our vision of righteousness is not so much to walk with God as to walk with man. Whereas Noah walked with God, but it was at the expense of sharing the plight and the and the concerns of man. This is what the uh, Al Sheikh says about. And as I said, we have looked at two very brief um, excerpts. He doesn't write in brief, he writes at length. And um, I hope that you have enjoyed our introduction to Ramosha Al Sheikh and I would uh, 
just say that if you're interested in more, then by all means, uh, crack open a safer copy and you can find it in English as well. It is available. And uh, if not the Hebrew, by all means. And uh, thank you very much for listening. I'm sorry, I don't have too many, too much time for questions. I don't mind taking some questions if there are any. And um, let it go. Actually, I should mention as well, uh, for those who haven't counted the Omer yet, it's just about the time now. So the timely reminder for anyone who would like to count the Omer uh, when we bring it to them this year, it's just about nine. Lovely. Okay. Uh, if there are no questions, then I'll just take the opportunity to thank Rabbi Sun once again for extremely interesting and, uh, and informative exposition about the Al Sheikh. And uh, we look forward eagerly to next week for the RE. Ari. Thank you very much indeed. And look forward to all next week. Uh, good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Laila Tov, Lekulam.